A very good morning and a warm welcome to all the participants who have joined us for this uh, second inaugural session of uh, Business Live. This is our second year. And I'm uh, really happy that we have received a excellent you know, feedback for our first session of uh, 2021. Just to give a brief, we've received about 1,500 participations from uh, over the last year from India, China, UK, Europe, Russia, USA, uh, and many other places. Um, we hosted 10 speakers uh, from all over the world. Um, and it's been a very um, warm uh, experience overall. We now begin with the second uh, season, as we call it, second year of our monthly live series. Business Live. Um, the first inaugural session of uh, the second year will be uh, delivered by Professor Mark Palin. To briefly introduce Professor Mark, Mark Palin uh, is working as a professor of microbial genomics at the University of East Anglia and a research group leader at the Quadrum Institute in Norwich, UK. Uh, for two, two decades, uh, Mark has been at the forefront of efforts to apply sequencing and bioinformatics to a range of problems in microbiology, including genomic epidemiology of pathogens and the application of metagenomics in clinical uh, and veterinary microbiology and in ancient DNA research. Uh, recently, uh, Mark has uh, broken new ground in applying lenien binomials to hundreds of new species from animal gut microbiomes and in devising creative new approaches to the generation of new taxonomic names en masse. And this is the topic that he is going to touch today, like how nomenclature has come of age from um, the ages of pedantry to pragmatism. He has advised the World Health Organization on the use of names for SARS-CoV-2 variants of and helped bacteriophage experts all over the world to develop hundreds of new names for viral species. Uh, Palin is also the director of the Microbiology Cloud Computing, called as the Climb Big Data Project, and of the doctoral training program on microbes, microbiomes, and bioinformatics. Thank you all for listening, and um, I'll set the stage for the presentation. Good morning, and thank you for the invitation to talk at this uh, business uh, uh, event. I pre-recorded this talk because it's going out at 6.30 on a Saturday morning, when I'll have arrived uh, just back from the Gambia the night before and we'll be in a hotel room in Gatwick Airport. But I will join you in real time for the question and answer session afterwards. So I'm going to talk to the, on the topic of nomenclature of archaea and bacteria in the age of genomics from pedantry to pragmatism. And what I'm going to do is give you a historical introduction and then uh, look at the problem of naming the unnamed how do you name a prokaryote? How do you do it with the pedantic approach? Uh, highlight how there is freedom within the code to be much more pragmatic, uh, describe some progress and problems with using descriptive names, and then I'll finish up by making the case for the use of arbitrary names for bacteria and archaea as we go forward. Now, usually in these events, you have to give a declaration of interest uh, to avoid conflicts of interest. So I have to uh, admit to you that I belong to a sect known as metagenomic fundamentalism. Um, and you can see here the tenets of this particular belief system laid out. Um, we believe that uh, Lord Venter created the world on April the 2nd, 2004, when he published uh, the description of the metagenome of the Sargasso Sea, um, and we believe he seeded his creation with misleading evidence of a pre metagenomic era to test the faithful. Uh, key point here is that we believe that there should be only one diagnostic and taxonomic test, and that is metagenome sequencing. And you can see we venerate various deities and saints. Um, there's been one breakaway group, so-called old order metagenomic fundies, who venerate the uh, pre-Venturite brotherhood of Lord Woes of Illinois and Lord Pace of Colorado. Our paramilitary or jihadi wing is called Shotgun First, and we've been get there engaging in vicious war of coverage with the last remnants of the 16S order of the Amplicon. Um, 
This is obviously tongue in cheek, but there is some truth to it, as I will explain as we go through the talk. Now, I'm going to give you a very brief history of bacterial taxonomy in five DWEMs. Uh, so, what are DWEMs? Well, let's start with the idea that we're dealing with uh, the history of great men and their contributions to the field. I'm sorry that they are uh, so far only men. I know that the discipline has become and is becoming far more inclusive as we go forward, but uh, following Longfellow here, let's, let's look at these five great men who've made a contribution. Um, and also, just to clarify, Dwem means dead white European male, and yes, they are all dead white European males, um, and that doesn't mean uh, that I don't agree that our discipline should become much more inclusive as we go forward, but this is what the hand that history has dealt us uh, in uh, the history of our discipline. So let's start with Carl Linnaeus. Um, he uh, was considered the, the father of modern taxonomy. He came up with the hierarchical classification of plants and animals. Uh, another major contribution, though, was his use of Latin binomials. So that very long description there in Latin uh, becomes just a two-name uh, Grisophila fastigata, uh, like a sort of surname and a, and a first name, a very easy way to refer to species. Um, and uh, Linnaeus, he was not a modest man, he said Deus creavit, uh, Linnaeus dispo disposavit, that means God created uh, and Linnaeus classified. And so he, he put himself there on a pedestal, but he had a great sense of humour as well, uh, with the names he came up, you know, homo sapiens, wise men, slightly wise man, slightly tongue in cheek there. He's named for the blue whale, uh, Balanoptera musculus, well the musculus means small mouse. It can also mean muscle, but it doesn't make much sense. But calling the largest animal on the planet a small mouse, a sense of uh, humour there. He, he named a, 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 a flower, Ipomea nil, where nil in Latin means nothing, quite literally means nothing. Um, there is some suggestion that actually he was drawing from an Indo-Iranian root that means blue, but quite literally it means nothing. And uh, he named some uh, flowers, Clitoria, uh, which um, illustrates his obsession with the sex life of plants, uh, uh, perhaps with sex more generally. If you're interested there, there's a, a link to a very interesting article describing the, the kind of wit of, uh, of Linnaeus. Next on the list is Charles Darwin, who obviously came up, a uh, British naturalist who came up with the theory of evolution, with, uh, embedded within that, the ideas of natural selection, um, descent with modification, branching evolution. And it's this branching evolution, descent with modification, that explains the groups within groups, the hierarchy that you see uh, in Linnaean classification. Uh, and, and here's a quote from, uh, from Darwin. Uh, all the foregoing rules and aids and difficulties in classification are explained on the view that natural the natural system is founded on descent with modifications, that the characters which naturalists consider as showing true affinity between any two or more species are those which have been inherited from a common parent. And in so far, all true classification is genealogical, that community of descent is the hidden bond which naturalists have been unconsciously seeking. Uh, so he really made, made quite clear uh, that his theory of evolution uh, explained classification and all classification has to be uh, genealogical. Um, and there's a little sketch there from one of his notebooks, I think it's the earliest uh, depiction he ever did of an evolutionary tree um, with the dots showing extinct forms and the three branches there showing current forms. And if you're interested to see more about whether Darwin actually did stick to this idea that all true classification is genealogical, there's a, there's a review article by Padian there from 1999, which is very interesting on that point. Although Darwin made clear that uh, it, the theory of evolution meant that all uh, uh, classification should be genealogical, that wasn't necessarily followed, and it's down to this guy, really Hennig, who uh, made clear uh, that, that systematics should be phylogenetic. Um, phylogenetic has just been a, a, a more modern way of seeing, saying genealogical. Um, and he came up with this idea of uh, phylogenetic systematics, otherwise known as cladistics. 
uh, with the key point that organisms have to be grouped into clades or monophyletic groups. And the only valid taxonomic names are those that apply to clades or monophyletic groups. Obviously, there was a lot of uh, heat, uh, uh, heated discussion about this in the mid 20th century and late 20th century. This clade versus grade uh, controversy. Could you describe um, dinosaurs without including birds? And now we talk about the classical dinosaurs as non avian dinosaurs. Are we allowed to use the term reptile? Um, uh, and uh, in fact, in bacteriology, um, are we allowed to describe archaea without including eukaryotes within the archaea? But generally, all of this um, has, has been settled in Hennig's favour, even though some of the uh, evolutionary heavyweights were against the idea. It's now become uh, really pervasive. Phylogenetic thinking is pervasive in, in taxonomy, not just uh, of animals and plants, but now of bacteria. Also need to do a hat tip to uh, Fred Sanger, this uh, British uh, Nobel laureate, twice over. Uh, he came up with this approach of DNA sequencing with chain inhib terminating inhibitors, um, which became so widely adopted and is, is still really at the heart of most sequencing approaches uh, going on today. Um, his approach uh, underwent tremendous progress so that the cost of sequencing fell dramatically and outpaced, uh, outpaced uh, even uh, the, the Moore's law that applies to computers so that it's now become so straightforward to sequence anything you want, including bacterial genomes, that this becomes the technique of choice for doing anything, including bacterial taxonomy. And then finally, of, the, of these five DWEMs, uh, we, we must pay homage to Carl Woese. Uh, he was the first, not the only one, but the, the, the one that did at scale uh, and changed our thinking in terms of how we can use sequences and sequence-based approaches to derive phylogenies of um, all life, including bacteria and archaea. And he was the one that made the distinction between bacteria and archaea. And I can still remember uh, coming across his uh, review article on bacterial ev evolution in, in 1987 uh, and just being absolutely amazed to see uh, the way in which uh, evolution uh, bioinformatics and sequencing had come, had come together uh, to deliver this tremendous and exciting new approach to classification of bacteria. And in fact, if you look back at uh, Darwin's uh, little sketch that he made in, I think, the 1830s, you can see that Darwin was actually somewhat prescient because if you, if you look, there was some invisible ink, which if you develop it, you can see that he actually had foreseen Carl Woese's three domain view of life with eukarya, archaea and bacteria as his three branches there. So sequence-based taxonomy then uh, took off in a big way um, and, and uh, went fast forward. It started off with 16S, uh, but then moved on to DNA, DNA hybridizations, and then genome-based taxonomies. Um, there was this introduction for term candidatus for uh, species and other taxa that were defined only by sequence-based approaches um, and that's still where well, they haven't been cultured uh, and that approach is still in use today. I made a small contribution towards uh, a progress towards genomic taxonomy 10 years ago when we published a paper where we looked at whether uh, the classical definitions of species within the genus Acinetobacter matched up nicely with uh, genome-based uh, definitions, and we found, by and large, they did, um, uh, and so laid, helped to lay the foundations for uh, um, a, a genome-based approach in taxonomy. Of course, there were many others working in this field at the same time as well. And in recent years, there's been tremendous uh, progress uh, towards an all-encompassing genome taxonomy, as realized in the Genome Taxonomy Database, uh, run by Phil Hugenholtz, uh, who's shown here. And, and you can see the tremendous reach of these efforts so far. Uh, the, the very first paper, the standardized bacterial taxonomy, uh, revising the tree of life, cited over 1,400 times. Um, and the toolkit, uh, which Phil and, and Donovan Parks and others 
devised to uh, allow you to search against their database has already been cited by over 800 people in just a few years, in fact just in two years. So you can see the tremendous reach of these approaches um, uh, and very exciting uh, progress here. And in fact, yeah, as I say, there are many others also involved in this. And this is just a, a, just a handful. I can't be comprehensive here. But you can see it's just tremendous progress with metagenomics um, in documenting uh, new life forms uh, across the whole tree of life, particularly bacteria and archaea. Um, but we're also seeing uh, progress with culture as well, so that there are um, many more organisms, particularly from the human gut, that are being cultured, where people once thought you, know, you couldn't actually culture, most things wouldn't culture, but if you try hard, you can. And again, just to mention our own local efforts, uh, we've uh, recently in my group, uh, particularly Rachel Gilroy, shown here, has been leading a project on documenting extensive microbial diversity within the chicken gut microbiome uh, using both uh, metagenomics and culture. And, and this rather busy slide just shows you our workflow here, which is a, a fairly standard workflow taking uh, metagenomic samples um, and then binning those into what we call metagenomic assembled genomes and then uh, looking at those in terms of what species they belong to and we found uh, many novel species came out of this analysis, over 300 novel species um, uh, revealed by uh, this kind of approach. But this reveals a problem of naming the unnamed. Uh, so genome-based taxonomy is a victim of its very own success here. So the genome taxonomy database documents over 40, 47,000 species but only about, only about a quarter of these have well-formed Latin names in the style of Linnaean binomials. Um, and the rest of them have confusing, hard to remember, alphanumerical IDs. Examples are there. These are more like telephone numbers or uh, credit card numbers than they are uh, anything useful that you can remember. And on the right there, you can see the typical kind of output that we get if we take a gut microbiome. I think this one is from a horse, and we use the GTDB toolkit to work out what's there. Uh, you can see that we just end up with a large number of um, very difficult to use uh, alphanumerical IDs. Um, and it's very hard to get your head around this, it's very hard to communicate this to collaborators um, or, or to other people in the scientific community. Um, using these alphanumerics. So how do we approach this? Well the conventional approaches which rely on generating names from descriptions of bacteria or from people or places, typically these are you naming about a thousand new species names, creating a thousand new species names per year. So if we continued with that kind of approach, that kind of pace, we, we, it would take us 30 years or more to, to, to name the backlog of over 32,000 unnamed species in GTDB. Um, and of course, by the time we'd done that, the current rate of progress with GTDB, we'd have hundreds of thousands more to name. Um, and obviously, I'm not the first person to say this. Many people have said that we need uh, to have a form of taxonomy for uncultivated microbes. There's been tremendous... Uh, controversy in the field about whether uncultured microbes can be given names with standing. Uh, it's led to this schism where the, 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 the conventional code is, is um, being complemented by what's called the SEEK code uh, so that we can do this. The old uh, code, uh, the, IC, the ICMP, does actually have a provision for uncultivated organisms, the so-called candidatus option which I reviewed recently and said yeah it kind of works it does, it's not broken really it does kind of work but the problem is it doesn't give you names with standing which can be seen as a problem in fact I can see it also as sometimes a, a, a useful uh, feature uh, of the candidatus option so if we wanted to name a prokaryote, well, how do we do it? Well, we've got the International Code of Nomenclature of Prokaryotes, which is the, you know, the fundamentals of it, going back to the, the idea of fundamentals. This is 
this is what we have to turn to 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 to, to learn how to do this. Um, but on top of this, there is a, a body of literature where nomenclature experts have given us their advice about how to do this uh, and, and how to do this in the way that they think uh, is most acceptable. I've recently added my own article uh, to this and uh, I'm going to be speaking about some of the things I mentioned in that article. Um, uh, I've come to this uh, topic fairly recently but I think I've got a good enough grasp of the fundamentals uh, to be able to make some useful contributions here. Um, and how did I get here? Well, the first time I came across the code and, and the difference between rules and recommendations in the code was a couple of years ago when a colleague of mine here, um, who, whose name is Falk Hildebrand, uh, Falk um, named an organism after himself and his supervisor uh, in a paper. Um, and uh, this other guy here, Aharon Oran, who's a nomenclature expert, uh, pounced on this and said, well, this is not right. You can't, uh, you, you, you can't just call it Borkfalki, because that's not a, a Latin form. No Latin noun ends in I like that. Um, and you're not really supposed to name things after yourself. That's uh, deprecated. Um, but Falk went and read the code and said, well, it's uh, the, the thing about not naming after yourself, that's just a recommendation. It's not a rule, so I can ignore that. And so I helped Falk uh, write a response to Aharon's letter in which we said, okay, we'll call it Bork Falkia rather than Bork Falki, but we'll stick with the name of Bork Falkia named after those two individuals. And so it made clear there was this tension between the rules and the recommendations um, and um, they're not equivalent. And that led me into getting interested in the code and, and so if we want to look back at the code and, uh, and see how it has um, changed over time, we kind of in effect adopt a phylogenetic approach and it's been slightly whimsical, we haven't done a sophisticated analysis of the text here, but this gives you a, 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 an overview of how the code has evolved and it really uh, is very much of the descendant of a, a document from 1867 um, by the Swiss uh, uh, plant taxonomist de Candle who, who put forward the laws of botanical nomenclature then. Um, and um, the, the, the various other codes, the zoological code, the botanical code, the bacteriological code, were all descendants of that, as is the current ICN, ICNP uh, and the, in fact the SEEK code, which I mentioned already, which is coming out this year uh, and is uh, based on an initial modest proposal here from uh, Barney Whitman that has now uh, turned itself into the SEEK code. But the SEEK code is uh, largely derived from the existing code in terms of the text and so forth in it. Now if you look at the uh, lines of descent of the code over time, one thing I've noticed is that there is uh, a, a move from pragmatism to pedantry. So the earliest versions of this code were very pragmatic. So here's De Candolle's Laws of Botanical Nomenclature, uh, Article 1, no real progress without a system of nomenclature. Um, number 2 though says the rules should uh, be neither arbitrary nor imposed by authority founded on considerations clear and forcible enough for everyone to comprehend and to be disposed to accept. So clear need for inclus inclusivity uh, at the earliest stage there. And the Article 3, the essential point in nomenclature is to avoid or reject the use of forms or names that might create error or ambiguity or throw confusion to science. Next importance is the avoidance of any useless introduction of new names. But then listen to this crucial point here. Other considerations such as absolute grammatical correctness, regularity or euphony of names, uh, a more or less prevailing custom, respect for persons, etc. Notwithstanding their undeniable importance are relatively accessory. So they're basically pointing out you don't have to be pedantic. That's not important. Communication is important. 
Enshrined there is the principle going back to Linnaeus, that scientific name should be in Latin, uh, and when they're taken from another, Latin, uh, another language, the, a Latin termination is given to them. Um, even though there, there are some exceptions to that. Um, and he points out that uh, genera, subgenera, and so forth are uh, uh, substantives, it's nouns, um, um, and the names can be derived from any source whatsoever and maybe even be arbitrarily imposed under the restrictions mentioned further on. So very pragmatic in 1867. And a lot of that, even if you fast forward for nearly a century to the first bacteriological code in the lecture, the same points apply, uh, almost verbatim. So absolute grammatical correctness, blah, 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 relatively accessory. Um, and, and names can be arbitrary. So that these, these points go all the way back. 1858, it's a wonderful document there, the, the International Code, um, and it's got a wonderful uh, commentary on all of the points in there. And again, there is this uh, inherent reasonableness in everything that's said, um, and also in includes these points about the, uh, being pragmatic, um, the essentials are to communicate, um, and you're allowed arbitrary, uh, um, arbitrary coinages as well. Problem is, when you move forward to the 2008 most common, uh, most recent version of the International Code of Nomenclature and Prokaryotes, as it's now called, all that stuff about you know uh, not needing absolute grammatical correctness or not, not being paramount has been thrown out, and so we still have aim at stability of names, reject noise that can cause error, confusion, avoid useless creation of names. And instead, we have this nothing in this code may be construed to restrict freedom of taxonomic thought or action, but nothing about linguistic pragmatism. Uh, and the same points about that names should be in Latin, but names can be completely arbitrary. So, you know, the code seems inaccessible to many people. Why should that be? Well, the first uh, point here, principle three, is that the scientific names are all, all taxed are Latin or Latinized words treated as Latin regardless of origin, usually taken from Latin or Greek. And rule six says the same sort of thing. All taxa must be treated as Latin. Now, this does create a problem because Latin and, and also to some degree ancient Greek, the orthography and the grammar are really quite vexatious for many people. Um, and so there are many different options available to us. We can create a species like Escherichia coli, where the, um, the species epithet is actually um, a, another noun, but in the genitive. We can have a name like Disulfo vibrio gigas, where it's a noun, but this time it's in what we call the nominative case uh, in Latin, um, uh, uh, where it's just another way of describing the organism uh, without showing any um, uh, 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 showing the kind of relationships you get with the genitive. You can use adjectives, as in Staphylococcus aureus, but here we have this problem in Latin, is that adjectives have to agree with the noun they describe in, in their gender. So we have Staphylococcus aureus, both ending in US, uh, because they're second declension nouns. And then we've got Mycobacterium africanum, here showing that you've got the genitive ending, but then lower down, Pseudomonas originosa, um, and this is because these are um, third declension, so Pseudomonas is a third declension noun, it's not quite so obvious uh, what um, gender it belongs to, but the originosa is showing you that it's actually a feminine noun. But you, it'd be hard to guess that without further uh, information. And then sometimes there are um, what we might call false friends. So you might assume that every genus name that ends in an A is going to be feminine, but those that end in soma, which is a Greek word, which is actually a neuter noun, those have to um, uh, be described as neuter nouns with the neuter form um, of the uh, adjective, so article here. But of course, if there are uh, validly accepted names that have broken the rules and still being used, like Mycobacterium abscessus should be abscessum, I guess, but that's a difficult one. And, and, and uh, there are also tremendous problems, as I mentioned, with the kind of pronunciation and orthography. So uh, tremendous, horrible 
uh, tremendously horrible consonant clusters, so Cthonomona Dacii, uh, terrible vowel clusters as well. So, you know, if you're a, a native speaker of Chinese or Hindi or um, Japanese and you come across a name like that, I, I suspect you're going to stumble pretty, pretty, pretty well over that. Um, and um, some of these names just get really very long as well. So there's a very long name that's uh, uh, natural keo baculum Egypt, yeah, Egypt, Egypt, Egypt. These are tongue twisters. Um, and if I'm a native English speaker with some knowledge of Latin, but I stumble over these words. Uh, so there's a lot that does make the code appear inaccessible in that regard. Um, and this is compounded. If you go and look at the, the code and you look at the Appendix 9 on orthography, there are page, page after page of pedantic uh, rules about how uh, the grammar should be used, how names should be formed. A table 2 about the ways in which you form the names of genera from personal names. This is absolutely obscure nonsense, really. Um, uh, it, it's all to do with whether the Latin name is treated as a family name or the name of a trade, um, whether uh, that decides whether you add an extra I or not. It's just a mess. Um, and in fact, this is actually being compounded more recently with a, a, a suggestion from her and Oren and colleagues where um, if you're going to form a, a name for a bacterium uh, from a, a personal name um, and you're doing it at, where you're fusing the personal name with another root, what they're suggesting is that you actually add an extra I. So uh, names that already exist like Isenibacter or, or, or um, Lawsonibacter under their scheme should become Lawsoniibacter. Uh, or uh, I, I back to, which I, I get, it's, it's hard to pronounce, it's, it's ugly in my opinion. Um, but the key point is that all of this, the appendix in particular, this amounts to recommendations. These are not rules of the code, these are just recommendations. And as we've seen with Bork Falkia, we can ignore recommendations, they commonly are ignored in many cases. Before I get too um, downhearted about Latin, now there are benefits to Latin, and uh, I'm not suggesting that we necessarily give it up. Linnaeum nomenclature has stood the test of time, and uh, um, Latin is a neutral language. It's not owned by any contemporary nation. So if we were to use English, then people would say, well, hang on, you're just uh, um, compounding Anglo-American hegemony. Uh, imperialism. You know, Latin is a neutral language. And it's already in common use in many languages. It, it, throughout the world people are using words that are based on Latin or, or Latin and Greek. And, and in English and in other languages Latin forms a kind of linguistic substratum. So we, we look upon Latin words as, as being familiar. We, we can, I see a word built from chloro for example, which is a Greek root, uh, that comes into Latin words. Um, I, I think of green, you know, there's a familiarity there. But there's also a sense of gravitas. These are words that are to do with science and, and, and formal um, uh, discourse. And the key point is when people say, oh, this Latin's very hard, you don't have to gain enough mastery of Latin to be able to discuss science with Pliny the Elder or politics with Cicero. There's really a very few simple rules you need to learn to name bacteria according to Latin grammar. Um, and Ahara and Orr has pointed out, if you, know, if you can learn R or Python, and most PhD students, postdocs, are easily doing that, you can cope with a little bit of Latin along the way. And in fact, uh, in my review article, I, I did, um, discussion article, I, I did tabulate here a lot of the online language resources are available to you now. There's never been a better time to be making up Latin names uh, in microbiology, because you've got all these resources available to you. But uh, as I say, we've, we've got this problem of the code seeming inaccessible, but I would argue that actually, if you look carefully, there is tremendous freedom within the code. Okay, there's a densely written, old-fashioned, jargon-heavy, repetitive document padded out with four prefaces and 13 appendices. Yeah, you'd be right to think, well, that 
ICNP is inaccessible and intimidating. But when we strip it back to its bare essentials, the code is in fact surprisingly flexible, and perhaps even radical in sense in what it allows. So a key point is that the code adheres to what we might call syntactic minimalism. So the principles and the rules that flow from them have to be obeyed, whereas, as I pointed out, recommendations can be ignored, and they often are. And the code here adopts what this syntactic minimalism, and it specifies very few linguistic rules that have to be obeyed. Almost all that it has to say on languages of advisory rather than mandatory. And to give you a, a really compelling example, how you know, it's a recently published name that ignores the recommendations but complies with the rules and therefore is a validly published uh, Mixococcus, Planvia, etc. I'm not going to try and uh, uh, speak all that Welsh there, but this is a validly published Latin name for uh, a, a bacterium. So principle, what, 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 what are the rules, the syntactic minimum? So we, this is it all on one single slide. This is all the code tells you you have to do. You must do. You must not use names already used for animals and plants. You must use names that are Latin, uh, that the treat as Latin or Latinized words. You're not allowed to don't use diacritics. You're not, for some reason, allowed to use ordinal adjectives above 10 if you're making species names, for example. You can call them uh, primus or secundus, but you can't go above 10. Um, genus names must be singular nouns or adjectives used as nouns. They must be assigned a gender, and they must start with a capital letter. Species names are combinations of the genus name followed by the species epithet, and then the species epithet. It must be a single word in lowercase. It must be a noun, as I mentioned before, in the genitive case, or the nominative in apposition, or it must be an adjective that agrees in gender with the name of the genus. That is all there is in terms of the rules about making names in the code. In addition to the syntactic minimalism, there's semantic minimalism. So names don't have to mean what they say. So we know there are some systems that make sure there's a precise one-to-one -one relationship between the components of the word and the characters of the thing you're trying to describe. So here's an example of a name uh, under the UPAC code for, for naming organic chemicals. Um, and so you could work out the chemical structure from that name uh, in, in a very straightforward way if you understood the UPAC code. But that doesn't apply to uh, the names of bacteria. The, the code makes clear, principle four, the primary purpose of the name is to, simply to supply a means of referring to a taxon rather than indicate characters or history of the taxon. Um, and rule 55 says that it, you mustn't replace a name just because it doesn't accurately describe the taxon. So here's a couple of examples of names that are commonly used but are actually inaccurate factually. So Bacteroides melanin and genicus, it doesn't actually produce melanin. Haemophilus influenza, it does not cause influenza, but nonetheless these names are commonly used. They're still used. One way to think about this, if you, if you called a woman Rose Tyler, she called herself Rose Tyler, she would not be saying that she is literally a flower, or that she literally works in the garment industry. These are just labels that have, uh, that have been attached to her. They have hi history uh, going back, but their contemporary use doesn't depend on that history. They're just, they're just arbitrary labels, in a sense, even if they do have meaning. There is this conflict between stability and correctness, and um, in the past, uh, the nomenclature experts, one in particular, Hans Trooper, had a big problem with, he didn't like the idea that names were not right in terms of what they were saying. And he went in and, and he made uh, a, a, some, a lot of corrections uh, and had an argument with this guy, Morgan Killian, about whether names like ratus, streptococcus ratus, means streptococcus, rat, just means rat didn't mean of the rat or rat-like, it just means streptococcus, the rat. And that's what upset Trooper. Oh no, you can't call a bacterium a rat. Um, and he went in and changed all those names, even though the names have been in use for many years. Um, and here's just a, on the left side there, there's just a, a, a screen dump from my paper looking at some of the other conflicts that have gone in. And it's not just in uh, bacteriology, in zoology and, um, and in botany. People argue about, does it really matter about this gender agreement? 
Do we have to make a fuss about it? Of course, uh, although there is uh, a lot of freedom, um, uh, as long as you make the things look Latin, you can do what you like. You know, where do the limits of good taste uh, begin and end here? So, uh, an era of branca is um, uh, formed after the English word branch, just kind of made into what we might call dog Latin. Um, and yeah, you could have smelly old soccus. Uh, you could use any old English words. To me, that would look ugly. Um, Streptococcus bluensis is also another one where it's kind of named after blue or, or, or the French word bleu uh, without a, a Latin, uh, a direct Latin root that's been used. Um, I don't like the idea of, of, of just importing Latin into Latin English words like that. Uh, but that, I have to accept that's a matter of taste. Uh, the, the candidate phyla radiation phyla uh, a few years ago um, were named after members of the Harvard faculty. Um, wasn't quite all European men of European descent. There were some women in there, but nonetheless, was that inclusive to just name uh, a load of phyla after one uh, the faculty at one university? Our colleagues working in, uh, with plants and animals have uh, a, a much greater sense of humour, uh, 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 similar to that of Linnaeus, when they name things. Uh, so, uh, protists have been named Huey after Huey, Dewey and Louie, after the nephews of Donald Duck. Um, insects have been given names like Uma Guma, after the Pink Floyd album, or uh, Frodo used as a species name after the character from Lord of the Rings. There's a snail called Bar Humbuggy. Um, there's an ant in Madagascar called Procetarium Google, uh, with the English word Google used because the ants had been, uh, the location of the ants had been discovered uh, using uh, Google Maps. Um, um, but there are limits to the taste. I, I think all of us have to agree that even though the rules don't forbid it, uh, the recommendations are that you don't name organisms after people not connected with science, and that goes all the way back to De Candor. Uh, there is a, an organism here, Anopthalmus hitleri. It's, it's a blind insect that lives in a cave that was named after Adolf Hitler. Um, uh, naming them after a blind insect that lives in a cave, is that actually honouring Hitler or not? But I think that, that to me that does go beyond the limits of good taste, and we, it's something we should clearly be avoiding. Now, coming back to our chicken study, what we wanted to do there, when we discovered all these new species, we wanted to try and make Linnaeus relevant in the age of metagenomics. And, and so uh, what we did was we said, well, look, we've got all these new species. We want to give them well-formed Candidatus Latin binomials. Um, and working with a Haranoran, uh, I came up with this idea of combinatorial use of dozens of Latin or Greek roots pertaining to poultry, guts and feces and microbes, so that we could name all of them um, with well-formed names. And this is just a, a, a screen dump here from a page of um, the protologues that we created for hundreds and hundreds of these species. Um, and you can see that the kind of approach that we adopted here, uh, where we um, Included uh, the name uh, Electro elect, uh, Electriobacillus murdavium, um, and we defined it here as murdavium as of bird feces, um, and Electriobacillus cut from the roots of chicken um, and uh, bacillus. And a key point here is that in our descriptions, all we did was we just uh, provided a phylogenetic placement. Um, and that is my view of how we are now, is that long descriptions involve lots of phenotypes and so forth, they're no longer needed in the modern age. Basically, all you need is enough information to make a phylogenetic placement, because, as Darwin pointed out, classification is effectively genealogical or phylogenetic. It doesn't require lots of descriptions. So then we move further forward uh, into what we might call Pythonic pedantry. We, uh, I, I said, well, to, to home, maybe we could roll this out much further by using this kind of combinatorial approach. And I got a colleague, and, uh, Andrea Teleton, to write a Python script that allowed us to combine uh, Latin and Greek roots uh, and metadata to create uh, protologues at huge scale. 
So here's an example here where um, we could take prefixes and combine them with Latin and species names. We could take general roots, say for a horse, and then specific roots for the uh, particular habitat, and then end units, and we could you know, create 2,000 new names for horse gut microbes. And we could do the same thing with names of people or places um, uh, and create lots and lots of new uh, names that way. So we actually set the target of, uh, of having over a million new names for archaea and bacteria. And this was published in Trends in Microbiology a couple of years ago and seemed to have generated a lot of interest actually. But uh, in the intervening time since we did that study, it's become clear to me that there are problems. This generic name space is too small. So if, we, if, if we've got over like 5,400 uh, 5, mammalian gut microbiotas, and each of them has, I don't know, even 10 unique genera, we're going to create 54,000 names, meaning gut microbe or dung microbe. And there's just not that many roots in Latin and Greek. Now we could go in and make those names more specific and say, okay, uh, we, we, we want to put in chimpanzee into the name um, uh, and uh, add that. But then what if it turns out the organism doesn't just occur in the chimpanzee but also occurs in the gorilla, then we've been too specific. And the problem with those getting too specific is the names become uh, imprecise then. Um, and also the names just get far too long. Uh, so in a follow-up paper where uh, some people proposed a, um, a way of uh, automating the creation of protologues, they used our system to come up with these very long names, here, which are just unpronounceable, they can't be remembered easily. Um, and if we did want to be precise uh, in our descriptive names, then we, we, if we wanted to say reconstruct metabolism and make the names based on that, that's going to require metabolic reconstructions, exhaustive searches and metadata for over 32,000 unnamed species. And that's a non-trivial aeroplane task. It'll take uh, months or years of work and it probably even then wouldn't be satisfactory uh, because you're only naming a thing after one characteristic out of many, many thousands that you could have chosen. So in my recent article I propose a, a number of solutions. This one potential solution is arbitrary shortening. And there in fact are precedents uh, among existing names where names, uh, short, handy names have been created. Uh, here's one called Demoquina, which is derived from demethyl melaquinone. Uh, it's an unusual quinone found in that organism. Just an arbitrary shortening of it. Another one, Methermicoccus, is de derived from the fact that you've got a, a small methane producing the thermococcus. So, you know, taking one of those names, uh, Hoministerca or Adaptatus, if we call that Hosterca, you create a name that's easy to use. There's still a, a kind of link to a meaning and to a derivation. Um, a similar approach has already been used to create genus names for viruses. So, we could perhaps use this kind of approach to make uh, the kind of handles we're using uh, more useful and easy. Another option would be inclusive use of roots. So although the code says, there's a recommendation saying that you should only use roots from other languages apart from Latin and Greek if there are no equivalents in Latin or Greek, if we went and said, no, we can just use whatever language we like, um, this will open the door to short euphonious names for microbes. And it would give us a more inclusive approach to non-European cultures. You know, so if we wanted to name microbes from chickens, we could have Ophimonus from the Hebrew word for chicken, Casibacterium from the Hausa word, Chicola from the Chinese word, or Mergimonus from Hindi, so that we could have short words, short names, uh, that were still descriptive, but also uh, more inclusive. If we look at current practice, it's also problems uh, that make it inaccessible that are custom and practice. They're not in the rules, but they're kind of just customs have grown up. So what we have is that, that uh, every time new names and new combinations are published, they go into these lists uh, that are published in, in the International Journal of Systematic Evolution and Microbiology. Uh, these lists are published uh, in, in, in a, an approach that's suited to paper format rather than the modern digital age. These are not uh, machine usable. 
and there's a huge amount of pedantry there. So, for example, with this one example here, um, Petrocella uh, is the name of a, a genus, and the nomenclature experts go in and say, well, I think the etymology should change because Petra actually comes from Greek. It's originally a Greek root um, rather than New Latin Petra. In fact, Petra as a Greek as a Latin root was used uh, in the Latin translation of the Bible, commonly used in Latin. So this to me is uh, make work pedantry, pointless. So the problem is that these lists are not machine readable. So if you want to download that stuff and put it into a database, it's it's a dreadful business. Um, and there are databases for bacterial taxonomy, but these fail to meet what we'd now call the, the FAIR criteria, finable, accessible, interoperative, reusable. You know, the openness that we expect in modern science is lacking here. Uh, the the so-called LPSN, this is the names of standing in, in, in nomenclature, uh, they ret retain IP and you can't download the whole database, you can't reuse it. Um, names for Life, which is actually used in those lists, is a private company. Um, so I, I fail to see how the use of a private company is compatible with open science. And so what we do need is we need resources for name creation, we need a scale of automated approaches to generation of names, and we, but we also need resources for name curation. Um, and I think we, we really do have to go forward looking with the development of an open source database of microbial names run on these fair principles and that has to be a priority as we go into the future. In my uh, paper I, I made a few suggestions about how to make things easier. So I went and looked at uh, some of the li some proposed linguistic emendations, I'll call it emendations rather than corrections because things weren't necessarily wrong it's just that the nomenclature experts didn't like them. Um, and how could we avoid uh, that going forward? Um, and so I, I suggested that we could use it online linguistic tools so that it would make it easier for people to check whether terms are well formed. Uh, we could be a bit more re relaxed in our approach to recommendations. Uh, and one other thing that I suggested was that protologues could actually be simpler. So protologues are not actually specified in the code, even the word protologue is not used in the code, it just says you have to give a description of the thing as you name it. And so current examples of the way protologues are configured by custom and practice, but not by the rule, not, not mandated by the rules, are shown here on the left, and on the right I'm showing a, 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 a simpler way of providing the same information that complies with the rules of the code, but makes it simpler, less pedantic for people, less off-putting. And so this was a, a, a summary uh, slide from that paper that I wrote about how we could move forward in the future to make things more accessible. And there's a link there uh, to the DOI for that particular paper if you're interested to follow that up. But since I wrote that, well, as I wrote that paper and more recently, I've, I've come to realise that um, we need to change the way we think a bit more. We need to go back to basics in some ways. So we have to recognise that names are just labels. And generally there's no link between a name and a thing. Uh, names can be created and agreed on in advance of you. So when we name storms, we name them like Storm Francis. But by calling it Francis, we're not actually saying anything about it descriptively. And this object here, if it, you can see it in the picture here, if we were describing that in French, we would describe it as an arbre. We would describe it in uh, English, we call it tree. And uh, the linguist Saussure pointed out, that in fact, the link between the word and the thing it describes is entirely arbitrary. Uh, sorry, that's a bad linguistic pun there. But all these names are arbitrary uh, for the most part. You know, aside from things like UPAC, uh, general use of, of words and names, there's, there's, it's all arbitrary. And the arbitrary names, use of arbitrary names in taxonomy, as I pointed out before, goes all the way back to, to Candor. Uh, it goes, in fact, all the way back to Linnaeus. Uh, so Linnaeus created arbitrary names because he made up anagrams or, um, or, of, of surnames. He didn't do it in a systematic way. Um, in the 1830s, an English botanist said, you know, it's so impossible to construct generic names that express the peculiarities of species to represent, that I agree that 
those who think a good, well-sounding, unmeaning name as good as any that can be contrived. Around the same time, a Scottish naturalist just made up this name, Carinella, for a marine annelid, and you can see to Candor in 1868, said that basically the names, can, they can be combinations of letters that are quite arbitrary. All that's required is it does not lead to confusion. Uh, and and he, he made this very pragmatic point that some people have complained that the name of a, of a plant, Gundelia, it's named after a guy called Gundelsheimer, but it's not formed in a systematic way according to the, the purist approach to the way in which names should be formed. He points out that just, okay, just accept it's an arbitrary name uh, and it doesn't matter that it isn't formed in a, uh, in a way that um, uh, purists would want you to do it. If you move forward into the 20th century, early in the 20th century, uh, a guy called William Kierfort, he made up over a hundred arbitrary rhyming species epithets because he ran out of descriptive names. So he added the Barna, Karna, Dana, Bavana, Kakana, Dadana. And many of his names are still in use. They were validly published and they remain in use. In the 1852, a, a guy called Raymond Casey just made up this Greek sounding name, Gaithemon. Uh, which has been cited in the art, zoological code as a name built for an arbitrary combination of letters. And a few years later, the botanist uh, Gordon Rowley professed names are uh, more often than not mere handles. And the most that we ask of a handle is it's be neat and easy to grasp. And even the, the nomenclature expert Hans Trooper, I mentioned earlier, made a comment on making arbitrary names via rules in the code, 10a and 12c. He said, these rubber paragraphs open up a box of unlimited possibilities for people whose Latin are exhausted. But in view of the million names that will have to be formed in the future, they are a simple necessity, whether Latin purists like them or not. And given that Trooper was a Latin purist, that's quite a statement from him. Aharon Oren, uh, who bears the mantle of Trooper now as a nomenclature expert, um, in one of his recent guides to nomenclature, said, indeed, theoretically, it's possible to use or misuse, very strong value judgment there, these rules as a pretext to legitimize almost any name, as long as the ending looks remotely like Latin. Uh, fortunately, in the prokaryotic nomenclature, we've thus far been able to avoid excesses, but that uh, is not necessarily going to be the case in the future, and it is a value judgment. It's only to do with recommendations, not rules. So, what have I done with this? Well, recently I've uh, devised an, uh, an exploited an approach to generation of well-formed arbitrary names that preserve the look and feel of Latin and are grammatically correct. And we've assigned these to all the unnamed uh, taxa in GTDB as, as candidates' names. So here's a few of the random names that we've created, like Anaclana, uh, Diponatrix, or Dilapia, Armitededo. Um, and, and, and for people who don't know Latin, they just look like Latin words. They don't recognize that they're meaningless and just being made up. Um, and this flowchart here just shows you the approach that we've adopted here, where we just ripped off the front end of Latin words um, and we've added a, a number of uh, suffixes drawn from a list in Wikipedia, in fact, of, of Latin feminine suffixes. Um, and then assign these to all those alphanumeric taxa in GTDB, replace those alphanumeric placeholders with the new arbitrary names, and we even went so far as to create protologues. So for the bacterial taxa, there's a 10,000 word, a 10,000 page protologue as a, as a word document uh, for the purists who'd like to pour over protologues or to say that if you don't create a protologue, you haven't really done the job properly. Now this took a considerable uh, undertaking. At the age of 61 I had to learn Python. I started off learning Python in a day. I learned it well, yeah. I managed to start writing my first Python scripts to do this. Um, a bit later in the game I realised it would be a lot more efficient if I had help. So uh, my colleague here, Nabil Farid Ali Khan, stepped in and, and although I'd written the pseudocode and the outlines of these scripts, he actually made them much more sophisticated and elegant and efficient uh, in their coding. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, we've got these uh, 10,000 page uh, sets of protologues where every name has, has, has been described properly. You can download it there if you really want to see it. Now, the key point is that 
we've called these candidatus names. They have no standing under the current code. Um, so if any if anyone says, well, how, you guys don't know, really have the right to name all these things. In fact, there are no rules in the code as to who has the right. Uh, is it the people that actually got the samples, the people that tracked the DNA, the people that sequenced the DNA, the people that did the classification? Uh, it's not as simple as it used to be in the old days where if you out isolated the thing, you got the kind of right to name it. Um, uh, but if people don't like it, and people say, well, actually, I, I don't like that name, I want to give it a, a descriptive name, they can do that because our candidate's names have no standing. But what we're doing is that we are providing the, ourselves and the user community with a, a set of names that make it much, much easier to use the GTDB toolkit and to talk about the contents of complex microbial communities. My feeling is that once those candidates' names have been published in a peer-reviewed paper, which is likely to be happening soon, they're going to percolate their way through into the databases, into NCPI, into GTDB in an official capacity, uh, uh, and things will stabilise. And in fact, there has been some discussion about whether some of these names could actually be incorporated into the seat code at its first publication um, to give it a, a bit of impetus so that they stop being counted artist names but actually become validly published names under the seat code. What's the current state of play with this? Well, at the moment, there's a preprint up, uh, which you can go and look at if you like. Um, I've done a Twitter poll uh, where I presented this and asked for opinions. And okay, you might say it's an anecdotal, 53 votes. Um, we got 66% of people saying yes, they preferred arbitrary names to just using alphanumerics. 34% said no, so you know, a strong majority in favour. There have been discussions with uh, Phil Hubenholtz, who they're bringing out a new version of GTB in the next week or two or three, um, and we're going to actually go and rename everything in that and make that a final paper that's published. Uh, I've been working most recently with Miguel Rodriguez, who is part of the Seat Code team. He has pointed out that the names, as initially configured, were not distinctive enough. Um, and in the Seat Code, they say that they want all the names to have a difference of at least three characters. So we're currently in the process of uh, meeting that criterion. It's a quite a strict, uh, quite a hard criterion to meet, and we're, we're hopeful that we can get there. Um, the paper has been submitted to IG, uh, IJSEM and is currently under review. One, one reviewer was very, very happy with it, another not quite so happy with it, and more reviews are expected. We've had a lot of discussion actually recently on this stuff in uh, some podcasts. Uh, so you can listen to myself and Phil and Ian Sutcliffe discussing these issues and much, much more in those podcasts if you're interested. And so, in conclusion, uh, we, we, I've outlined the case. We face a pressing problem of naming the unnamed. Uh, there is this problem that bacterial nomenclature seems intimidating, but it's surprisingly flexible. If you look, just look at the rules, there's much scope for making bacterial nomenclature far more pragmatic, inclusive, and accessible within those rules. But there is this problem that use of descriptive names really doesn't scale very well. And I propose that the future belongs to arbitrary, user friendly names which can be deployed and will be deployed very soon at scale. So that's it, that's me finished. I just have to acknowledge all of those individuals who've helped me uh, along the way in uh, gaining insights into this field um, and having discussions about issues. Um, and so now I'll leave it open and uh, I will take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for the excellent um, conversation on uh, discussing with the automated system and what problems we face and how things can be worked upon. And personally, I would like to thank you for uh, joining so early after your uh, most, what, adventurous flight, I would say. Yes, yes. It, it actually wasn't so bad as it, uh, some flights earlier in the day, people filmed them and uh, they were very dramatic landings at Heathrow, but my flight was not too bad. But it got back a couple of hours later than it would have done otherwise. Okay. So I've only had about six hours sleep. Okay. Um, I'm glad you are uh, very, you look very fresh and awake. Well, uh, yeah. So, so I apologize to anyone who, if the slides didn't appear good. Uh, we pre recorded the talk, so it gave me a chance to wake up between 6 30 and 7 30. I'm a lot fresher and better than I would have been at 6 30, I think. 
No, and I've made, this, I've made the slides available as a PDF. There's a link there in the chat. If someone wants to download the slides, if you didn't see something clearly, then that's available. Yeah. Um, so if you're ready to take questions, I'll uh, shoot them your way. Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, so the first question comes from Ian Sutcliffe. Um, I'm not against arbitrary names, but have a concern that when generated combinatorially, then some, perhaps many, can be very awkward to pronounce and very similar to each other, which is typically a source of confusion. So how do we filter these? Yeah, so that's the hot topic at the moment. So um, after the, we put the preprint up, um, and uh, uh, it's now very common that people put up a preprint of a paper that they're looking to get published in a journal as a way of encouraging discussion to make things better. And that's what we've done. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, Miguel Rodriguez uh, contact, well, I heard down, uh, from, from a contact from me and uh, not from me and from um, Phil Hugenholtz that, that he had concerns about the fact that the names were not distinctive enough. Um, and so we've been having a lot of discussions and doing a lot of analyses to make sure that the names are distinctive. Um, so there's a thing called the Levenstein distance between uh, strings that computer scientists use, uh, which is basically if you, if you have a Levenstein distance of one, it means that you can change one letter in a word. Uh, you can change it from one to another, or you can delete it, or you can add a, an extra letter. Uh, and what uh, Miguel has said is that the C code is proposing that there should be a Levenstein distance of three, which is a very strict criterion. And, and we're seeing if we can actually comply with that uh, to, make, to make the names really very distinctive. But the other thing, that, that there is this dynamic between do you go for distinctive names or do you go for names? If you want distinctiveness, obviously you can just make very long names. Right. But the longer you make the name, the harder it is to pronounce and the harder it is to remember. Uh, and so we are currently playing with a, uh, this trade-off. And the thing to remember about, as in many aspects of life, there's no perfect answer. There's always a trade-off. Do you want short, simple names with the, perhaps the chance that they might be a bit more confusing? Or do you want long, longer names that are, can't be confused but are harder to remember? And the other point that I've made to, to um, Miguel is that when we assigned the names in our first effort, uh, we did so randomly. And so the names are just sprayed out across all of the, the, the genera that are 47,000. And the, so the chances of two names uh, being similar, being applied to genera that could be confused, i.e. within the same family, or in the same uh, ecosystem was very, very low. Um, and in fact, it, it, in current practice, there are many names where you could say, well, they are, they could be confusing. Uh, anyone who's a clinician will have come across the term Enterococcus fecium and Enterococcus fecalis. You know, they're, they're, they're two names, they mean the same thing more or less, and they would be considered confusing if, if, if you were to be strict about it. But as far as I'm aware, nobody in clinical practice ever gets confused by those things. So this is, yeah, this is a very important and hot topic, and it's one that we're carefully paying attention to. Uh, we're currently in a process of creating a revised version of the paper that takes this into account. Okay. Um, so the next question I quoted is from Jan Guzman. Um, Jan writes, thanks, Professor Palin, for your talk. I believe every unique bacterium or a sequence that is collected by metagenomic surveys has managed to survive to this day. And so in my opinion, they deserve some of our time to name them. I believe creating a name is an artistic and humane activity and not to be given to robots. Yeah. Well, yeah, okay. So if you want to spend the rest of your life, name, I think we're probably, the next edition of GTDB is out anytime soon in, an, in another fortnight. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm guessing that we'll now have 60,000 or 65,000 new genera that needs names uh, and species that need names. It, 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 it's, it's just simply not possible to do these things by uh, the old manual way. 
the way in which people used to write a single paper for a single organism. And Ian Sutcliffe has made this point in the past that to get a paper to describe one organism and, and give it a name and a, and a brief description, mm. uh, those days are past. Uh, and, and the thing to do is not say, oh my goodness, this is a bad thing. This is tremendous because we are discovering huge numbers of species. Right. Our, our knowledge of the biosphere is increasing all the time now. Um, right. and, and it's just exhilarating to see that we're learning so much more. Ian, in one of his talk here, made the point, though, that we're still at the level of only describing 2% of bacteria, right. even with, with, with you know, 60,000 unnamed bacteria. Uh, it, it, uh, there's this often said that, well, maybe there's a million. I, I don't know. There may be more than a million. Uh, the, the, the figures vary. Yeah. But, you know, for, for, for um, people to sit down and say, I'm going to write a million single name papers, that'll just clutter mm -hmm. up the literature and it will be a waste of everyone's time. I, the point is, no one is saying that if you want to do it the handcrafted way, you want to spend a lot of time making a name, you can't do that. The names we're creating are candidatus names. So if your favorite organism that turns out, I don't know, say, say you study the, the kangaroo microbiome and you, and you love all the organisms in the kangaroo, and we've named one of them with our arbitrary names, and you say, no, I want to actually name it with an Aboriginal word, or I want to name it with something that says it's in the kangaroo, you can overwrite the name um, with, a, with a new name. Um, so we're not, we're not trying to force anyone's hand here. Right. So I didn't make the case forcefully enough that mm -hmm. there are many people now, hundreds of groups around the world are using GTDB. Mm -hmm. microbiome, you end up with a lot of these alphanumeric uh, uh, labels, which are impossible to remember, you know, UA3241, UA4239, they're just, uh, you can't use them. And so we're not doing this just because we can, we're doing it because there's an unmet need to, to make these tools more accessible to people and make these uh, ecosystems more accessible. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll just add, um, I didn't complete the question. So uh, oh, I, adds, there are enough persons on earth and every interested person could be given the chance to name a bacterium following certain basic rules. And of course, then checked by some experts. This would be a remarkable democratizing taxonomical exercise in our globalized post pandemic world. Well, you're welcome to do that. Uh, as we said in the paper, that we're not aware of anyone else trying to name all the bacteria that haven't been named yet. Um, and if anyone has a parallel uh, process where they want to go and do that themselves, you can do it. There's nothing to stop you. This is where the code is extremely flexible. In terms of candidatus names, anyone can name, uh, uh, create a candidate. In fact, anyone can create a name, uh, even for the validly published names, there are no rules about who has to who has the right to name a thing. Um, and so if you want to create names for things, you can do it. Nobody's stopping you. But up till now, nobody in the microbiome research community is addressing right. this problem. Nobody's been looking at this at scale. Um, right. Um, so Ian has added uh, in the chat box a comment regarding this question. Um, Ian writes, the catalog of life recently published a paper cataloging over 2 million names of macroscopic organisms. It seems reasonable that there will be many times more microbes, not exactly. least as macroscopic organisms have microbiomes. So, yeah. it, uh, you know, it's more reasonable to under, underestimate what we know now. Exactly. Yes, I think so. The task would be humongous if we don't give an automated way of naming yeah, yeah. I mean, so if you take mammals, I think there's about 5,400 mammals species. Right. Yes. If we said that each of those mammal species in their gut had, you know, say 100 unique uh, species, right. Um, right. that would be, that, you know, you've got half a million just from right. mammals. Then add birds, add reptiles. Um, and then, of course, if you start looking at invertebrates, I suppose in, I, I, my assumption is that invertebrate microbiomes um, are simpler than those of, of, of mammals and, and birds. But even so, there are millions of insects. 
Right. Even if each insect only had one unique bacterium associated with it, that's another mil millions more names. Yeah, so this is a, this is a, I've made the point before, on the edge of the ocean here. Um, and the, the current approaches are like trying to empty the ocean with a teaspoon. Uh, you know, w w another metaphor is that this is this vast ocean of knowledge. And it's just amazing that, that there's so much out there that we can see. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, this is probably a similar question. Uh, do you have any clue what is the upper limit of estimated number of bacteria in archaea? Well, I'm, I'm not an expert. I haven't done any of the calculations myself, but uh, yeah. there are, uh, uh, there are um, papers out there that say billions. Um, and it's, it, they're, they're, I haven't got the literature in front of me at the moment, but there, there, there has been this lively discussion and there was an editorial that said, oh, millions after all, because someone uh, then went and recalibrated the expectations and said, well, maybe it's millions rather than billions. Um, and the thing is that we don't even know how many insects there are. Uh, and people argue, you know, are, are we talking millions or tens of millions of different, uh, different insect species? And so if we don't even know that, we don't know how many bacteria or archaea are associated with those insects. Uh, right. There are uh, uncertainties of orders of magnitude, tens or hundreds of times wrong we could be in, in our estimation. And um, yeah. Um, the next question is from Alessandro. Um, the question is, do you think that bacteriologists, uh, example, ICNP, can declare extinct a validated species and in which circumstances? Well, you mean that the, 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 the name applies to, to what is now an extinct species because yes. it, it's no longer been... Yes. Well, the validly published names... Uh, there is this rule, and it, it's extremely controversial. And uh, Ian Sutcliffe, you, he'll, he, 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 if, if you, if you uh, are very nice to him, will explain to you the, the tremendous pain that the community's been through to right. try and address this problem. That to validly name, uh, to validly publish a name for a bacterium, you have to deposit the bacterium in two separate uh, culture repositories in two separate countries. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea of that is that bacteria will never go extinct because even if one of those repositories uh, it, 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 uh, undergoes a power cut, which means it loses all its power or, 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 or gets blown up or, 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 or there's an earthquake that destroys it, there will be in the other country, there will still be that organism. So I think it's quite, I'm not aware actually of any cases where someone said that organism um, no longer exists because obviously it may no longer even if it no longer exists in in the laboratory it may exist in the wild Absolutely. but this is I, I mean coming back to, it is an interesting question so the black rhino we're at the stage uh, of uh, i think um we've got two individuals left um and when those individuals die that species will die and therefore, it is entirely reasonable to think that there may be microbes in, in, in that gut microbiome of the black rhino that go extinct when the black rhino goes extinct. Um, and my, my, I'm actually make, I have been making the proposal that we should be focusing on threatened species and trying to recover their microbiomes and biobank them, even if we can't culture things, even if we just kept, you know, tons and tons of feces or kilograms and kilograms of feces for future use, uh, th those organisms will be, would be retained for future. Yeah. Uh, so I, uh, yeah. That, that's what my take on that. You, you probably will have a sample to at least study when technology, you know, changes and advances. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, so there are tremendous advances, even with um, organisms that couldn't be cultured in the past are now, uh, they can be cell sorted. You can you can culture them, co-culture them, um, uh, and and yeah. So the fact that we haven't been and and in fact in gut microbiology, the, the, this assumption was carried across that what applies in the soil, which is that there's a an uncultured majority, uh, was a, a carried across without really much thought. And people right. like Trevor Lawley and DDA Raoul and others. In, the, in their labs, they've been applying um, 
great care to culture gut microbes and they find that they can actually culture most of them if you try hard enough you try lots of different conditions um, and, and, and so there is hope that uh, we can recover those organisms and then save them. Of course, there is one, if we're going to be really looking into the far future, um, Craig Venter has shown us the way in that he resuscitated, he made his own artificial um, bacterium by just creating right. the genome and then injecting it into a living cell and replacing its genome. Um, and so... And this kind of thing's fairly routine with viruses now. It's, it's, it's perhaps not, you know, in another 10 or 20 years, the genome alone will allow you to resuscitate an organism, perhaps, uh, even, even if you can't get it in the, in the wild. Right. Yeah. Um, another question, it's probably a practical test of, of the automated algorithm. If any new species is not named immediately, what will be its correct tentative name? Well, at the moment, I'm not quite sure I'm following that. I, the, at, what happens at the moment is that GTDB, when it delineates species and names and, and genera and so forth, I mean, it's basically species and genera because the names above uh, the rank of genus are created from the genus name, from, from a genus name. Um, at the moment, they just use these alphanumeric designations. And so if, if nobody names those things, they just get given a name like SP00005321456 or whatever, like very long phone numbers or credit card numbers. You know. um, uh, the, the genus names are often the names that are just being given by a lab to the isolate or to a set of things that have been characterized in a particular experiment. And so there often are um, sets of genera that have very similar sounding, you know, UBA5231, UBA5232, and so forth. That's the current state. So the, the thing to remember is that there is not a competition here between nicely crafted names, very lovely descriptive names, and, uh, and, and arbitrary names or names created at scale by computer. The, the conflict here, the, the competition here, is between these very difficult to use alphanumerics that, that are machine readable but not human readable and arbitrary names um, or names created at scale at least. Right. Um, so um, Ian made a comment to Alessandro's question about extinction of names. Yeah. Ian says... Uh, oh, it's extinction of names. I thought he was talking about extinction of the bacteria. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, so says in regard to the ICNP, it makes no judgment regarding validated species. There are only validated, validly published names. Hmm. Names themselves do not go extinct. Separately, there are provisions under the code whereby a name can be rejected for technical reasons. A recent example is Opinion 106 regarding Rhodococcus huagi. Hmm. Okay. And uh, Fanus is commenting on your concern of black rhino getting extinct. And he says uh, through efforts, the population has increased to 16 to 17%. I, I missed my South Africa. I was talking about the northern white rhino. Sorry, okay. it, it is very early in the morning here. There's only two yeah. northern white rhinos. I know that. Great work has been done in, in South Africa yeah. to recover think, the black rhino. I think you, you, you need your coffee now. <laughs> yeah, well, I've had two cups already. But, okay. Uh, yeah. um, uh, just to add, I wanted to, uh, you know, quickly uh, uh, check with you. Uh, you mentioned C code in one of your slides where uh, you suggest that C code is something that's coming up with the uh, candidatus uh, species names and all that. So my question to you is, is your algorithm being used by C code uh, to devise names of uh, these candidates and uh, the ones that are going to be named in the future? So at the moment, the C code, the, the manuscript is under review is my understanding. Right. Um, and and the, the code itself it is therefore not yet published. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, what I've had is very much arm's length discussions uh, via Phil Hugenholtz, who said that um, 
he was in that, that there was interest among the people on the C code in using some of the arbitrary names that we'd applied to candidatus names and to validate them under the C code. Now there there are there are always controversies wherever you look in life, I suppose. With the C code, uh, what they have done is they're saying that they have to have for a name to be validly published under the C code, it has to be uh, the, you have to have a genome that meets their quality criteria. Right. Um, and so they make quite strict quality criteria. Um, and so interestingly, the, the GTDB uh, has been around for several years, has all the, it is a genome database. The genomes are in there. The genomes are, are, are also in, in other public databases. And they adopt um, a, a less stringent criterion for the inclusion of genomes in their database. And so what that means is that many of the things that are in GTDB and have been delineated in GTDB as genera and species and so forth, do not meet the criteria for seek code. Um, and therefore uh, they cannot yet be named under the seek code. But the interesting thing is that if you do name things under the seek code, so if we were to take 9,000 names that we've created for a candidata species and they were validated under the seek code, then they do kind of get hard baked in to the literature because then they are, they've got, they've been, they're validly published names under the seek code. If obviously mm -hmm. whether the community as a whole, whether editors, reviewers and so forth, accept the seek code is still an open question, mm -hmm. but that, so, so in a sense, if you, if you take that route, um, it does mean that, those names are there forever. And if someone says, I wanted to name this organism after some aspect of the kangaroo or, or, or the location it came from, or I wanted to honor my PhD mentor with a name, they can't do that. They can't replace our names. Um, right. and, 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 you know, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I haven't had any formal discussions with them yet. Um, I okay. guess their papers in review and mine's in review. We'll have to see what happens. Uh, yeah. Hopefully, in another um, few weeks or a month or two, we'll be in a clearer position. Yeah. So this is for uh, all the participants' attention. Uh, Professor Barney Whitman uh, will be speaking on the C code in the uh, March session, which is on nineteenth March, and he'll be talking on uh, why the C code was visioned out and uh, what is it all about. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, exactly. Then uh, we follow up with a uh, with a dialogue on the usability of C codes and uh, what are the pros and cons, and a discussion with uh, you know some of the uh, speakers who are uh, uh, you know aggressively for it and those who are uh, aggressively against it. Yes, yes. Business Live is uh, yeah. I think two sessions, one on the recent renaming and the inclusion of phylum level in the ICNP and uh, the implications of its inclusion and then following it up with the C code. So these sessions will happen in, uh, in May and June. So uh, for all the participants, this is a very uh, debatable topic and uh, your participation is most welcome for those. And um, Mark, thank you so much. There are no more questions, and I'm really. Uh, let me just uh, let me just uh, add to that point that the new phylum names they were yes. they were put out there without widespread discussion, mm -hmm. uh, no preprints, nothing like that, um, and uh, you know that that you know it, by contrast we've put up a preprint. We're engaging in discussion with interested parties um, with our arbitrary names. Um, and, and we're open to suggestions, uh, you know, and, and comments. And so we're, we're aiming to try and take the community with us. It will still be the case that you can't, you can't have everyone agreeing with you all the time. You can't, you, 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 you know, if the majority of people say, well, these names are good enough, they're better than the, what was there before, then that's good enough. But there will be a hardcore of people who say, no, this is wrong. You've, you, right. you, you crime or something, you know. You know. So, um, the session in May will have uh, Aaron Oren speaking for the uh, new names and uh, we'll have uh, uh, Karen Lloyd speaking uh, about the uh, implications of it and why the field needs to go back to what was there. So we'll, we'll have a, a presentation by each one of them first and then we'll have a dialogue between them based on questions that we'll be preparing for them. 
and then we'll have an open session from the audience uh, with the with the two speakers. Um, so if anybody would be willing to participate in the dialogue, please contact us and we'll be happy to include you uh, in the discussion if your uh, questions are very, very relevant to the topic of discussion. Um, few of the members have asked me to, uh, to talk about uh, the membership. So um, the membership for students is a separate pricing and the membership for uh, full members is a separate pricing. Both of these memberships will have uh, individual costing based on if you would like access to the Burgi's manual. Uh, so one of the membership charges uh, for the full members is $50 that includes the online access and $30 that does not include the online access. And for students, it's $30 and $10. So $30 includes the online access and $10 does not include the online access. But about the benefits, I've already spoken to you. You can listen, uh, you can watch a two minute, um, you know, about business on our YouTube channel where you will get all the details about the membership types and the costing. Um, but before we close, uh, thank you, Mark. Thank you once again for uh, being awake so early and uh, making up uh, for this uh, live session. Thank you once again. Thank you, Wang Jun. Uh, thank you, Ifti. And uh, I hope all our participants enjoyed. And uh, we'll see you in the next month on 19th of March. Thank you once again.